Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Vitra Life Group Academy Studio here at ASRM in Denver. We have a very exciting program for the next couple of days. And uh, kicking us off today is Debbie Veneer from West. And if you want to learn about embryo biopsy, here is the person that you need to listen to. Debbie, over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm Debbie. I'm from World Embryology Skills and Training. I've been an embryologist for about 30 years, and I'm excited to share a few tips and trips, tricks with you for embryo biopsy. Um, I'm not here by any means to tell you exactly what you should be doing, because I think with every embryo biopsy, you need to be changing up your game and adjusting to the embryo and, and how that embryo is working. So a few things I like to talk about when you're talking about a good quality biopsy for an embryo. Um, I think decision making and what you're going to be biopsying is one of the most crucial steps that an embryologist makes and this is very, very subjective. So um, what stage are you going to be biopsying? What quality are you going to be biopsying? Most laboratories have some type of criteria that will, you know, say we biopsy a BB or better or a 4BB or better. But as most of us that work in the clinical lab know, we get in there and it's like, well, this is sort of in between. So we'll talk a little bit about what we're going to be biopsying and the decision making. We can talk about size of biopsy pipette, day three hatching versus hatching at the time of biopsy. I think right now this is a big step where a lot of labs are no longer hatching on day three and they're deciding to just let those embryos be, let them grow through day three and wait till day five or six. And then um, I'm a big pusher proponent for more day six biopsy than day five. I know that's very controversial in the industry these days, but I do think um, sometimes embryologists are making that choice to biopsy embryos that are too early when the cells are too big. You end up with more lysed cells and a little bit more of an impact on the embryo. So I think it's important to consider that. Um, and then pipette size. I think the lysed cells in that biopsy sample the pipette size plays a big role and there's lots of choices out there for pipette size so be aware um, okay so what stage should you be biopsying um, i've been in labs where you know they have a written criteria but then when you see what they're biopsying it's not really what they're actually doing so i think it's important to talk to your lab mates about it are we biopsying these embryos that are just too early that just need another day the zona is not completely thinned some of these embryos are a little more borderline. You know, there's not a ton of cells in here, but I think it's a discussion that your laboratory should have. Quality, same thing. All of these embryos I took pictures of because I was actually forced to biopsy all of these embryos over time. <laughs> and none of these embryos I would have chosen to biopsy. But occasionally we had the doctor call down and say, I don't care what they have, biopsy anything they have. And then we end up in this weird situation of we have to biopsy a really poor quality embryo. So we'll talk about some tips and tricks for handling those. Um, biopsy size is always a big question. People are saying, how many cells? How, what does it look like? And this is a series of, of biopsies I did in one day. Some were a little too small, so I probably would have taken more. I would say this is borderline four to five cells, some of them a little bit larger in that eight cell range. Again, all of these are acceptable. Um, PGDIS recently recommended up to 10 cells in an embryo biopsy. So this is a big debate between labs right now is should we be biopsying on uh, or hatching on day three or should we be letting those embryos grow? And again, this is a personal decision from lab to lab. I'm not saying one way is right or one way is wrong, but there's some ramifications that come of that. As you can see, this embryo here is clearly hatching out. Most embryologists would probably biopsy it. But if it wasn't hatched on day three, I guarantee you it wouldn't be hatching out at all. And it would probably still be an early blastocyst because the cell size is so large. Whereas embryos that are not hatched on day three, that are able to expand out and grow, have a lot more cells. And we're able to take a much smaller biopsy, a much smaller mass, but there's more cells and more DNA in there for that genetics company to get a nice, clear read. So people that are often say, oh, I have a lot of no DNAs or no results, what's going on? I always say, let your embryos grow. You know, give them a little more time. I know historically we've been fans of day five embryos because they typically have a higher implantation rate. But there's a lot of data coming out, specifically iGenomics has some data coming out, or that is out, that says day six implantation rate is equal to day five. So something to consider. Um, embryos are allowed to expand out a little bit more. We don't have to worry about where the inner cell mass is hatching and a little less impact on the embryo because we're taking less mass. So again, not a right way or a wrong way, just something to consider. 
Um, day five versus the day six embryo. Again, this is allowing those embryos to push out a little bit. So for those labs that aren't hatching on day three, they see this embryo on day five and they're like, oh yeah, there we go. It's a, an expanded blastocyst. I'm gonna biopsy that. I tend to wait a little bit and let those embryos grow to day six. And again, it's a debate that your lab can have, but it's some, a discussion that I think your lab should have. What point should we be pushing to day six a little bit more? And w at what point should we go ahead and biopsy on day five? So um, letting that zona completely thin versus starting to thin, allowing for more cells in the embryo so your biopsy will have less mass but more DNA is, I think, a valuable thing to consider. Um, knowing your pipette options, I think, is big. I found people, when they struggle with biopsies, struggle with it, keep, it keeps coming off the holding pipette. Your holding pipette should not be the same holding pipette that you use for ICSI. You should have a wider inner diameter on your holding pipette to hold that embryo stronger. Um, easy thing to fix, all the, all the companies sell these as options with a wider inner diameter for your biopsies. Same thing with the inner diameter of your biopsy pipette. So you're gonna have a different technique of your biopsy. So for the smaller inner diameter, I call this the bouquet of flowers technique, where usually you're just pulling one cell into the biopsy pipette, and then you're arcing around your laser and your biopsy, it looks like a little bouquet of flowers, and all those cells never actually went into the pipette when the biopsy was performed. Perfectly fine, but that's specific to the type of pipette you have. You have the medium-sized pipette, which is the most common one. You're going to um, be pulling most of the cells into the pipette and then laser across near the opening of that pipette. It's probably the most common. I do find people that have very large inner diameters, and I would consider a large inner diameter 35 microns or larger. Um, that usually, there's a lot of ebb and flow of the media going in and out, and there's a lot of lysed cells in those biopsies. So if you have a 35 micron or larger pipette, you might want to drop down to 30. 30 is going to give you some really good control. So this is personal preference. Again, there's not one right or wrong way. You just have to have specific techniques set up. So I like to show a few videos. Oop, I don't know how to show the videos. Ah, can I play the video here? Oh, there we go. OK. So this is my current technique. So I let the embryos grow. I like them to be big and expanded. I make a very small hole that's going to be smaller than my biopsy pipette. It's going to be entered into the embryo. That first cell that I grab is always going to be the fattest portion of the cell. And I call that my anchor cell. I do not want my anchor cell to lice. That is my goal, is that this cell does not pop. If it does, you need better suction control. So I'm gonna milk it. I call this milking it going in and out of that zona area and letting that zona kind of help me feed those cells into my biopsy pipette. And then once I get about three or four cells into my biopsy pipette, I will start my laser process. And again, the laser does not have to be directly in front of my uh, biopsy pipette. It can be arced out a little bit. So you can see here I have one cell, two, three, and then four and five are just starting to come into the pipette there. So now I'm gonna move this under my laser. Oh, it popped off my holding pipette, so I'll just correct that real quick. And then I'm gonna give tension. So the tension is the key for us to be able to see the cell junctions. And then as I fire the laser, I should see that embryo responding. So you see it kind of popping each time that laser is fired. You can see there's five or six laser pulses here. Not real concerned about the number of laser pulses in my biopsy. And that little vibration you just saw was me tapping the capillary with a little pen. And that vibration just helps remove. So those cells are weakened by the laser pass, and then the vibration causes those cells to come off nice and easy. So that's that one. Okay, this is another one that I need to get played. All right, there we go. And then this is just quick laser, couple of laser pulses with a heavy tap. And this was a fully hashed blastocyst. So here we're actually holding onto the embryo directly with the holding pipette and fully hashed blastocyst. Okay, one more, couple of laser pulses and the vibration. Here you can see where I was expecting it to pull off and where it actually pulled off weren't actually the same. That happens sometimes, and we roll with it, okay? 
This is a video of this, a brand new trainee just trying this out. You can see her hesitation. So she has her cells pulled into the pipette. She's hitting it with the laser. And then you're going to see what she does with her hand and with the pen for that actual pen tap. So you can see her tap it, and you can see the vibration up there. She's a little hesitant to do it, but you can see it pull the biopsy off, and then she's going to yank it. There was a little string that was holding on, and then she just ripped that little string off. She's all happy. Good stuff. OK. So oops, can I go back one? A few important things for the flick. Just make sure your pipette is not inside the zona when you perform it. You want to make sure that you're at the thinnest section of your biopsy. Um, when you are pulling those cells into the pipette. The thinnest section is going to be your thing. We want to have at least four cells, okay? If you're in that, oh, I like to get two to four cells range, you're going to be more likely to get those no results and those no reads. So go a little heavier on your biopsies. Um, the Y plane, so you want to be flicking your pipette this way in the Y plane to and from you. Make sure your capillary is tightened down into the micromanipulator. And you can use a pen, your finger, you can use a a tool, a ruler, a serological pipette, it doesn't matter. So a couple of other techniques that I like to show is the pipette rub technique. So if we could get this one to play, this is where we're actually rubbing the two pipettes together to get the um, biopsy to come off. So bringing in the cells, and you'll see this cell lice, see it pop, not ideal, but that happens on occasion. So getting that four to eight cells into the pipette, and then you're going to release it from the holding pipette. You're going to come up and you're going to lay it on the top of the holding pipette and create tension. And then when you create the tension between the two pipettes, it snaps across and removes the biopsy from the embryo. So see the tension by bending it? And the biopsy tears off quick and easy, OK? This is something that's with practice with four or five or six times, you're actually able to get a pretty good biopsy off this way. I know it's scary for some people. This is a video of a student trying it for the first time. This is a trainee, a second try. They had one try. So this is a trainee, I think it's going, yeah. And what you really want it to do is slide across the front of that holding pipette. Obviously, they're hesitant. They're new at it, but with a little bit of skill, they create the tension by seeing that pipette start to bend, and then those cells come right off, OK? Um, this is just a video showing how you line your pipette up and how you get that tension. A couple other uh, samples here that I'm going to kind of buzz through. Um, aligning your hatching piece. So sometimes if you have embryos that are hatching, it's real important to make sure that you're pulling that pipette into the same plane of your focal plane and not try to biopsy up or down because your laser pulse is not as effective as right at the bottom of that dish. So you want to stay there. So a few quick tips to remember. Make sure you're not firing in the same place. I say form a V or a W, so kind of go down. And when you're going, if you have to make another pass, do not go past right the same spot. Stretch the cells before you, to create tension. Minimize your laser pulses, but don't be afraid of the laser. Use the zona or the oil to your benefit to create tension in those cells. Milk it, which means kind of pull in and out of that zona to get those cells into your pipette. Don't fire um, the laser on the glass pipette. That creates heat in the whole biopsy and can cause damage to your cells. Make sure that you backload your pipette enough with PVP or media so that you have good cell control. Make sure you grab that first cell right in the middle, not that. So you got that anchor cell is very key to keeping um, minimum lice cells. Separate the lice cells before deciding where to fire next. So sometimes people just go ding, 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 ding. And it's like, no, no, wait, no, wait and see what happens. Like give it a minute and see what happens. And then pay attention to that pipette size. So those are my tips and tricks for a good biopsy. So if you have any questions, I'm here to, here to answer. Great, thank you very much, Debbie. Thanks for all the tips there. Um, any questions here from our audience for Debbie? Um, Debbie, you pointed out a lot of tips and tricks here. What would you say in terms of training of an, a technician or embryologist to start with biopsy? What, what kind of confidence do they need? How many 
embryos do they need to biopsy to before you think they're ready to start doing clinical so it, cases? It will vary from trainee to trainee, but I typically say 100. So they have to perform to pass competency in my lab. They have to pass 100 biopsies and they have to have them documented, recorded, everything. And then we start to consider them for the competency assessment. Okay, it's a, it's a good benchmark for people to understand kind of what you're looking for. Yeah. Another uh, thing I was wondering, you talked about um, if people don't, uh, you know, they don't see their biopsies getting reads. It could be because the embryos are not developed far enough. You know, that's why you promote more day six biopsy. Mm -hmm. What about other troubleshooting um, points that they should be looking at when they get no reads? What, what are the other points that they should be looking at? So I say first you need to decipher between a no DNA and a no read. A no DNA is typically a tubing problem and the biopsy likely didn't get into the tube. And that's a whole different aspect of a no read. So a no read, the biopsy got in there, but it wasn't good quality. So if it's not a good quality biopsy, it can be from the embryo quality that you're choosing to biopsy. Um, and if you're biopsying BC, CC quality embryo, that's, it's not a shock if you're getting a no read from those embryos. But if you have an AA embryo and you get a no read from an AA embryo, then I start to say, what, what happened in that biopsy? And were those cells intact? I do think tubing plays a role when if they're able to rinse those cells well. So if there's a bunch of lice cells in your biopsy, those lice cells are gonna have free-floating DNA. The, 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 the nucleus lysis and there's DNA all over the place and it's not a whole set. So if you're tubing and you don't rinse those cells well and you put a mishmash of DNA into that tube, you send it off to the genetics company, they amplify it and then they see this big mess of DNA that doesn't make any sense. And then they get a no read. So rinse them really well, biopsy the best quality embryos you have with the understanding that occasionally we do have to biopsy poor quality embryos. And when you have to biopsy poor quality embryos, I think it's important to have those different styles of biopsy that you're able to do on occasion because not all the embryos respond the same. Great, so be neat and tidy and good at what you do. That's what you're saying. Yeah, good. Yeah. Listen guys, thank you for joining us in this session. Debbie, thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.